My dear friends, sisters and brothers, it is wonderful to worship God together wherever you are, at home or at work, those of you who are part of the essential services. Welcome to our worship service this morning. Today is the fifth Sunday of Lent. And as we worship God, the Lord be with you. And so may grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Let us say the Collect of Purity together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. During this season of Lent, we use the summary of the law. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us therefore, sisters and brothers, confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolve to keep God's commandments, and to live in love and peace with all people. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our fellow men in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. During this season of Lent, we skip the Gloria. And so we come now to the Collect. Let us pray. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing that you have made, and forgive the sins of all those who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts, that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may receive from you the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness of sins. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, whose life and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We shall now have the readings. The Old Testament reading is from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, verse 1 to 14. I felt the powerful presence of the Lord 
and the Spirit took me and set me down in a valley where the ground was covered with bones. He led me all around the valley, and I could see that there were very many bones and that they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal man, can these bones come back to life? I replied, Sovereign Lord, only you can answer that. He said, Prophecy to the bones, tell these dry bones to listen to the word of the Lord. Tell them that I, the Sovereign Lord, am saying to them, I am going to put breath into you and bring you back to life. I will give you sinews and muscles and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and bring you back to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been told while I was speaking, I heard a rattling noise and the bones began to join together. While I watched, the bones were covered with sinews and muscles and then with skin, but there was no breath in the bodies. God said to me, Mortal man, prophesy to the wind. Tell the wind that the Sovereign Lord commands it to come from every direction to breathe into these dead bodies and to bring them back to life. So I prophesied as I had been told. Breath entered the bodies and they came to life and stood up. There were enough of them to form an army. God said to me, Mortal men, the people of Israel are like these bones. They say that they are dried up without any hope and with no future. So prophesy to my people Israel and tell them that I, the Sovereign Lord, am going to open their graves. I am going to take them out and bring them back to the land of Israel. When I open the graves where my people are buried and bring them out, they will know that I am the Lord. I will put my breath in them, bring them back to life, and let them live in their own land, in their own land. Then they will know that I am the Lord. I have promised that I would do this, and I will do. I will, the Lord have spoken. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is from St. Paul's letter to the Roman, chapter 8, verse 6 to 11. To be controlled by human nature results in death. To be controlled by the Spirit results in life and peace. And so people become enemies of God when they are controlled by the human nature. For they do not obey God's law, and in fact, they cannot obey it. Those who obey the human nature cannot please God. But you do not live as your human nature tells you to. Instead, you live the Spirit tells you to, if, in fact, God's Spirit lives in you. Whoever does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ lives in you, the Spirit in life for you, because you have been put right with God, even though your bodies are going to die because of sin. If the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from death life lives in you, then he who raised Christ from death will also give life to your mortal bodies by the presence of his Spirit in you. So then, my friends, we have obligation, but it is not to live as our human nature wants us to. For if you live according to your human nature, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death your sinful action, you will live. Those who are led by God's Spirit are God's children. This is the word of the Lord.
the Holy Gospel according to St. John, John chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. John 11, beginning at verse 1. Glory to Christ, our Saviour. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, A short while ago the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you are going back. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. The disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews, who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you led him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. 
But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odour, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. In the name of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Once again, greetings to you wherever you are. Hopefully you are at home in compliance with the movement control order. We do, of course, know that some of you are at work because of the essential nature of your job and profession. The medical, the security, power supply, internet services, and so on. We thank you for all that you are doing. Today is now the third Sunday that we are not worshipping and fellowshipping together in our churches. Or how much we missed one another. We miss each other's company. We miss worshipping together as a body of Christ, a family belonging to one another and together belonging to God. I know we miss praying together and serving together. Yes, I know. You miss the Holy Communion. Don't we miss it? each one of us. And some of you might even say right away that this online worship, this virtual Holy Communion, isn't the real thing. It doesn't feel like the real thing. We do understand your position. Yet while we may miss many things, let us be certain of a few important truths. The church buildings might be closed, but the church remains open because you and I are the church together. Yes, you are the church. And the church is alive, always at worship, always at prayer, always serving. Second, even though our church doors are closed, worship never stops. We continue to worship. You must continue to worship. And today at this Eucharist, while you may not be receiving the bread and wine, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus, you receive blessings. Yes, together we receive blessings as we Remember. The Eucharist is very much about remember, about remembrance. Yes, remembrance is essential. Remembrance is central to the Eucharist, the Holy Communion, the liturgy. You would remember how our Lord, when he broke the bread, when he took the cup, said, do this in remembrance of me. And today, as we worship together, 
we remember. We remember God's love. We remember his sacrificial love. Today, again, we remember who we are. We are God's children. We remember who we are. We have been bought by the blood of Jesus. We remember we are children of God. We remember we are called to be like Jesus. We are members of the body of Christ, the family of God. Each one of us a member of the kingdom of God. Of the two men who were hanged side by side with Jesus on that Good Friday, one realized he was dismembered because of his acts, because of the life he lived. He was not a member. He was dismembered from the path of truth, from righteousness. And so he said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Luke chapter 23 and verse 42. And Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, Today you will be with me in paradise. Verse 43. Remember, remembrance is part of our worship, especially in this liturgy. When we forget to pray, when we forget to worship, when we forget to come to church, when we forget our baptism vows, when we don't live according to the gospel and the values of our faith, the way of our Lord Jesus, we dismember ourselves from the body. How very sad. Very sad indeed. And so what can we do about this remembering, coming back, to be part of the body, to be part of the holy body of Christ, the family of God. I want to invite us, especially during this season of Lent, to remember, to come back, to come back to the path of Christ, to come back to the way of Jesus, the life the truth. And so as we worship, my dear sisters and brothers, we remember ourselves with God. We come back to Him as God's family, by God's grace. And so in this act of worship, although you are at home and I am here in the bishop's chapel, we remember ourselves. We gather, we come back, we return. Let us remember who we are. Let us remember ourselves to our living God. And especially now during this season of Lent, and as the world continues to grapple with the real threat of coronavirus that has now become a global pandemic, let us come to God again. We have three readings for this morning. And these readings are taken according to the lectionary, not specially chosen for the purpose of where we are at this point as we face the pandemic crisis. And yet, because the word of God is the word of our living and loving God and Heavenly Father, His word is for such a time as this. God's word is for us now. I want to invite us to dig deeper into these words. But first, let us put things into perspective. The pandemic that we are facing is not something new. 
right there in the Bible, right there in the Old Testament, we have records of quite a number of outbreaks of diseases and epidemics. You would remember the story of the ten plagues that befell Egypt, where both livestock and people, the whole community were affected in Genesis chapter 9. You would remember in 1 Samuel chapter 5 and chapter 6 how the Philistines experienced an eruption of loathsome sores when they captured the Ark of the Covenant from Israel. You would remember in 2 Samuel chapter 24 how Israel themselves were inflicted by a punishment for King David's sinful senses. It was only when they offered the sacrifice to God that the Lord blessed them. In the Middle Ages, an outbreak of plague was experienced across Europe. It led to a great deal of resentment against the Jewish people who somehow miraculously seem impervious to the ravages of the disease. It did not occur to the population that the Jewish dietary and cleanliness laws had helped to insulate them from some of the contagions that was spreading. Right after the First World War, the Western world again experienced a lingering outbreak of the Spanish flu. Many died, not in the war, but as a result of the flu well after the war. Epidemics and pandemics. In our three readings, what is God saying to us? In the Gospel of St. John, chapter 11, we have here one of the seven signs that John incredibly put in place for us. And what we have before us, the story of Lazarus being raised again from the dead, the seventh and the last sign, with a clear message for us. It is about Jesus, our living hope. Jesus, our resurrection and our life. Jesus, who created us in love, redeemed us in love, is with us lovingly even as we are going through this difficult time of the pandemic crisis. And so, my dear friends, the good news is ever with us, is real, even as we face darkness, as we face challenges, as we face situations of helplessness and hopelessness. Jesus, our living Lord, brings us joy, peace, goodness, and love. And so as Christ's people, God's people, we can live even now that life of victory, resurrection life, resurrected life, when we believe in him. And that's the great message of joy that we can take from this gospel. Yet there is something very important to remember. As we face this crisis, as we feel situations of helplessness and hopelessness, it is easy for us to think that God is so far away, that God doesn't care, 
that God is powerless, that God doesn't feel for us. I want to remind you of verse 35 of our gospel, John chapter 11. This, of course, is the shortest verse in the Bible. John 11, verse 35. Jesus wept. Two words. Jesus wept. Here is something very profound. Jesus weeps with us. Jesus undergoes what we are going through in our life. Jesus understands the terrible time and situation that we sometimes face. Jesus, he understands who we are and what we are going through. Jesus wept. But this also posed a challenge for us. If Jesus weeps, if Jesus feels for us, you and I too are challenged to weep with others, to weep for others, to feel for others to carry their burdens, to care and to love all those out there who are in need. Jesus wept. And in this context, it was the death of Lazarus. There, Jesus wept. Death my dear friends, of course, is a terrible thing. However much faith we have, however faithful we are, however strong we are in the Lord Jesus, when death visits us or any of our loved ones, we feel the pain, the loss. And we have no reason, really, to try to deny or to suppress that feeling. Jesus wept. We must know that Jesus walks with us. Death is real. And yet, death for us Christians is not the end. Never the end. Because right here before us, Jesus is giving us the assurance, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me, though they die, will live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. A great promise from our Lord Jesus himself. He is our resurrection and our life. And so, dear friends, as we face our present situation and beyond our present situation, as we face life, let us remember this. Let us choose hope and not fear. Our hope is built on nothing less than the blood of Jesus, who is our righteousness. Jesus, he is our hope. As Christians, we are not just called to be optimist. In actual fact, we are not optimist. And certainly, we are never pessimists. Who are we then? How do we act? How do we live? My dear friends, as we are not pessimists or even optimists, this is what we are called to be. We are called to be a people of hope and faith. And not just hope 
or faith is an idea or an, an unattainable wish, our hope is built on nothing less than the Lord, the Savior, the Redeemer of the world, Jesus Christ. That's our hope. That's where our faith lies. And so as we face the present crisis, I want to invite you again to go back to our Old Testament reading. And our Old Testament reading was taken from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37. A familiar story, a familiar chapter with many, many of us. What was it? It was the prophecy of the prophet Ezekiel over against a valley, a valley of dead, dried bones. Wow. The valley wasn't just filled with bones or just dead bones. They were dry bones. A truly hopeless, helpless situation. Darkness. Death. Complete death. To an extent, that hopelessness and a sense of helplessness is what many of us are feeling as we face the advancing coronavirus disease. Where is God? How can God act? Ezekiel 37 gives us hope. And I want to invite you especially to look at verses 4 to 6. And to ponder on these verses slowly, deeply, carefully. The prophet Ezekiel was asked by God, Is there any chance for this? Ezekiel, in his humility, acknowledged, God, only you know. And Ezekiel was asked to prophesy. And here we are. Verse 4, God said, Prophesy to the bones. Tell these bones to listen to the word of the Lord. In verse 5, Tell them that I, the sovereign Lord, am saying to them, I'm going to put breath into you and bring you back to life. In verse 6, I will give you sinews and muscles and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and bring you back to life. My dear friends, there are important lessons for us here. God said to Ezekiel, prophesy to the bones. Ezekiel must obey the word of God. Ezekiel must obey the call of God. Ezekiel must obey the mission of God. Ezekiel must act in the Lord's name. When life was brought back into all these dry bones, it wasn't so much the power of the prayers or of the prophecy of Ezekiel, but the word of the Lord. The key is obedience. We too must be obedient to God. Tell these dry bones to listen to the word of the Lord. Verse 4b, Ezekiel did that. The word of the Lord 
we must trust in them. We must listen to God's word. Tell these dry bones to listen. God is saying the same thing to us. In our helplessness, in our hopelessness, in the darkness of our sin, in the darkness of the world, where life seem to have gone out of us when dryness is what we experience. Let us listen to the Word of God because the Word of God is life. And who is this God? Who is this Lord? Verse 5. Tell them that I, the Sovereign Lord, am saying to them, my dear friends, this is our God. He is the Sovereign Lord, the God Almighty, God above all gods, Lord, Lord above all lords. Our God is not just one of many gods. Our Lord is not an equal to other lords. No, our God is the Sovereign Lord. Sovereign over all, sovereign even over coronavirus, sovereign over our darkness, our hopelessness and helplessness. This is our God. And isn't God good? Verse 5b, I am going to put breath into you and bring you back to life. Life, my dear friends, true life, true restoration, true healing comes only from God, comes only from Jesus. And so we heard earlier from John's Gospel, chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. When God created this world, when God created Adam and Eve, they were just little things to begin with until God breathed his life into them. True life is only by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this we are reminded from our second reading, the epistle from Romans chapter 8. When we have God's Spirit, we have life. When we have life in Jesus, then only we can have life worth living, a life that has purpose and meaning. Life that is not just about body and flesh. It isn't just about physical being. And so when we talk about healing, when we pray for healing, what we ought to expect is that real healing, wholesome healing, by that we mean new life in Christ. And so I have been asked, and I am sure some of us are asking, why isn't God intervening right now and bring healing? Bring an end to this crisis, if indeed he is so powerful. My dear friends, the mission of Jesus, while he is miraculous, while he is powerful, while he is able to bring healing to the body, his primary mission is for the saving of our soul. Restoration in our relationship and fellowship with him. Coming back to what we said earlier about remembering 
verse 6 of uh, Ezekiel chapter 37. I will give you sinews and muscles and cover you with skin. The purpose and meaning of life, again, is a gift from God. When God gives us sinews and muscles and cover our skin, God is saying to us, your life is worth living. Your life is meaningful. Your life is purposeful. Live according to those. You have been forgiven. You are given righteousness. You are given wholeness in Christ. And so, as we pray, as we come to God, for healing, for his intervention, we must also individually, my dear friends, ask God, what is the purpose of my being? Why has God put me sinews and muscles and cover my skin? It isn't just for my sake. As Israel was brought back to life and God breathed into them, and place upon them new sinews and muscles and cover their skins, Israel was called to be a channel of blessing. You and I are called for the same purpose. I will breathe into you and bring you back to life. Verse 6b, a life in Jesus, that must be our prayer. And that indeed is what happened in the story from the gospel just read. In verse 45 of John chapter 11, all those who came with Mary and Martha, all those who were gathered there mourning for Lazarus, when they saw he was back, he was back brought back to life, they believed in Jesus. Our mission as God's people, as a people remembered back, is to go all out, proclaiming the goodness of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, that many will come to know Him, to love Him, even in the midst of the outbreak of coronavirus. If we recognize Jesus as our hope, our living hope, as we live out the gospel, my dear friends, God will reveal himself and make his presence known and felt and his blessings overflowing in our midst. And so I want to invite us, even as we continue to journey during this season of Lent, even as we continue to call upon the name of the Lord to live as his people, to walk as a remembered body, so that as we gather around this holy table to celebrate and to remember to bring into remembrance the love of God, his sacrifice on the cross for us, the shedding of his blood for us. May blessings overflow to you and your loved ones and together overflowing through us to the nation, to many others, to the glory of God. Amen. Friends, let us affirm our faith in the words of the Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, 
of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world, especially at this time as we face the coronavirus pandemic. And yet in the midst of all these troubles and challenge, let us also thank God for his goodness. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you promised through your Son, Jesus Christ, to hear us when we pray in faith. We pray for all your bishops and your church in the service of Christ. We remember Melter, our Archbishop, and all those who confess your name, that together we may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Almighty God, God of your own church, we pray for your church wherever they are at this time. We may not gather in church buildings. Help us to be your church at home, in our places of work, or wherever you place us at this difficult time. May we live faithfully according to our calling as we trust in our Lord Jesus who is our resurrection and our life. May we bring hope to this world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give wisdom to all in authority and direct this and every nation in the ways of justice and of peace, that all may honour one another and seek the common good. We pray at this time for our King, our Prime Minister. We pray for the Sultan of Brunei and all those in authority. We ask, O God, for your wisdom to be upon them as they work alongside one another, together with the various agencies, ministries and NGOs, both within the nation and international levels to find ways and means to bring healing and end to this crisis. Father, we pray especially for the Ministry of Health. We pray that by your grace they may be able to do all the right thing. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Give grace to us, our families and friends, and to all our neighbours, that we may serve Christ in one another and love as he loves us. Lord God, as your people, may we walk the path of Christ, who humble himself for our sake. And so give us grace at this time to live according to your values, to serve especially those who are badly affected by the current crisis. May we be faithful and serving neighbours to each other, serving one another with love and care. 
help us to remind ourselves of your calling for us. Remind us, O Lord, that whatever we do, even for the least of our brethren, we do it for you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. We remember at this time, O Lord, those who have been infected by the virus and others who are now receiving treatments for the various diseases and illnesses. Lord, we pray for those who are attending to them, the doctors, nurses, and all other medical personnel. We pray also for their family members, that together we may find courage and hope in you as we face these troubles. Above all, we pray you to bring us the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear us as we remember those who have died in the faith of Christ. We remember our loved ones. We remember that Jesus, our Lord, is our resurrection and our life, and that death has no power over us, that death has lost its sting, because in Christ, eternal life is ours. And so we pray, O Lord, that according to your promises, grant us with them a share in your eternal kingdom. And so, rejoicing in the fellowship of all your saints, we commend ourselves and all Christian people to your unfailing love. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends, we remember at this table the sacrifice offered by our Lord Jesus when he died for us on the cross. He, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, took wine, and gave thanks to God and called us to do this in remembrance of him. And so, even though you are at home, and I am here, this is our celebration together of the goodness and mercy of God. As we offer God this gift and give thanks to Him for this, His gift to us. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right. It is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise, Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, for He is your raving word. Through Him you have created all things from the beginning, and formed us in your own image. Through him you have freed us from the slavery of sin, giving him to be born as man and to die upon the cross. You raised him from the dead and exalted him to your right hand on high. Through him you have sent upon us your holy and life-giving spirit and made us a people for your own possession. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, 
God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let us pray. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, granted by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood. Who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross, we proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for the coming of his kingdom with this bread and this cup. We make the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Lord. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so accept through him, our great high priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him, and with him, and in him, by the power of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honor and glory and power be yours forever and ever. Amen. Sisters and brothers, as our Savior Christ has taught us, so we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Sisters and brothers, we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. As we continue to ask for God's intervention and mercy, we say the Agnus Dei together, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, grant us peace. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper.
body and blood of Christ. The body and the blood of Christ. My dear friends, receive God's special blessing. May God bless you and watch over you, even as we celebrate together this memorial of our redemption. Amen. God has fed us. God has blessed us. He is with us. Let us thank him. Lord Jesus Christ, you have taught us that what we do for the least of our brothers and sisters, we do also for you. Give us the will to be the servant of others, especially at this difficult time as you were the servant of all, and gave up your life and died for us, but are alive and reign now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Friends, receive now God's blessing. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you and your loved ones, today and forevermore. Amen.